It is a pleasure to welcome you to the third edition of the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. The AGERP lecture series is a pro bono initiative led by Dr. Partha Mishra and Professor Sarat Das. Initiated in 2020, it is aimed at disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. The International Workshop on Unsaturated Soils was hosted in 2022 during the third edition of the AGERP lecture series. The following lecture on revealing some mysteries of the soil water retention curve and preferential flow was delivered by Professor Alexander Schoerman at this workshop. Professor Alexander Schoerman received his diploma degree in civil engineering specializing in geotechnical engineering in 1998, and his PhD degree in 2005 on the topic transient seepage through quasi-homogeneous dikes, both from the University of Karlsruhe, Germany. In 2012, he gained his habilitation from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany, on the topic time domain reflectometry in geohydraulics and geomechanics. Since January 2010, he is working at the School of Civil Engineering at the University of Queensland, Australia. He was awarded in 2012 a Queensland Science Fellowship on the Further Development of Spatial TDR, and in 2018 the ARC Future Fellowship on Using Geophysical Methods for Monitoring Erosion Processes in Embankments. For more than 10 years, Professor Schoerman, with scientists from different disciplines, has been developing, modifying and applying electromagnetic measurement methods such as TDR for different questions in geohydraulics and geomechanics. His current research interests involve multiphase and multiscale processes underlining important questions on erosion, hydraulic and mechanical behavior of unsaturated soils and soft soils, and their application in dam engineering. Professor Schoyerman has advised in excess of 10 PhD, several master's and bachelor degree students and is the recipient of an outstanding HDR Supervisor Award from the University of Queensland. He is an editor for the Acta Geotechnica, and a member of TC213, Scour and Erosion, of ISSMGE. So let's have a start. And one of the motivations was uh, this happening, which happened in Germany in uh, um, 2009. In this case, it, is, uh, it was an, a deposit of some quite loose material, which failed due to the rising of the water table within uh, a former open pit mine. And when I compared the, the uh, velocity of the water table rise with the hydraulic conductivity, the approximate hydraulic conductivity of the material, it was more or less uh, the same. So under a gradient of one, uh, uh, the water would have flown then with that uh, uh, water table rise into the soil. But of course it needs to displace the air within the soil. So there uh, must have been some somehow a, a lack in the water table within the soil and in the, uh, and in the lake. So you will see later some examples where this plays a role and, and which is a bit of an eye opener. So the content is, first I will do a little bit of short excursus into spatial TDR because I, uh, uh, that technology plays a, a large role in the experiments I will show you now. Then I will introduce you to larger, uh, two experimental setups. One is the, uh, um, the DEM model, uh, which I also use for my PhD, then the column experiment, and then I will go into what I would like to show, some observations related to the soil water retention curve, and then also to preferential flow. Uh, and at the end, I will conclude and everything with some questions. So TDR, some of you have uh, probably worked already with it. It's a very common method used uh, in various disciplines to measure the moisture content. Uh, what is sent by an oscilloscope is an, a rectangular signal, which is then kept constant. This signal travels along the coaxial cable and enters then an, uh, uh, a sensor where we get the first reflection. When the signal is completely reflected, we get another reflection. With uh, an oscilloscope, we observe then the sum of the signals, the reflection and what is sent, and we can then analyze this signal in order to get an uh, travel time along the sensor forth and back. Uh, these are typical devices which are used now. There are 
more modern devices. I think TDR100 is discontinued and there is a new device from Campbell Scientific, but these are the common, uh, the common devices for conducting this kind of uh, experiments. And this is a conventional sensor, simply a fork as shown in the sketch before, where then the signal is then divided into the three forks with the, uh, the, the charge car uh, uh, carrying uh, wire in the middle and the, the grounds on the side. And you create, create an in the, in the ground electromagnetic field, which um, responses with, the, with the, uh, the, the, the conditions of the soil. So what is used throughout the study, what I, will, what I will show now, is a flat rim cable, which is insulated. And because of the insulation, the analysis is not that straightforward anymore, because there we have to use a so-called capacitance model where the dielectric permittivity, the, the parameter we would like to measure with this technology, is embedded in some capacitances which are connected to the, uh, to the insulation. But in principle, it's exactly the same. We are creating an electromagnetic field in the soil, but we have to take into account the insulation. And this can be done in a constellation like this with this equation. So if we do now a measurement with a coaxial cable, and what we did was always to measure from both sides of the cable for a specific reason, I will explain a little bit later. And then the signal looks like this. So this is the travel time. So we are observing basically uh, from the launch of the signal what is coming back. And right at the beginning, the signal is still within the device. Then we have some disturbances which are at the exit of the, of the, uh, of the device to the leading, uh, the feeding cable to the, to the sensor. This is the reflection we get from the sensor, a multiple reflection. And then there is another coaxial cable. And at the end of the coaxial cable, we get the full reflection. Yeah? What we are interested in is basically only what is happening in this little time window. And in order to analyze this, what we can do normally is simply to have with tensions to uh, assess the starting time of the sensor and the end time of the sensor, which is shown here. And this travel time, if you would have uncoated an uncoated cable, or a, a, a rod, we just simply can use the travel time directly to calculate the uh, dielectric permittivity. And from that dielectric permittivity, we can then with the calibration function for, for uh, the specific soil, re uh, determine the volumetric water content. If we have a coated sensor, then we have to go through another equation, which takes two parameters into account. Uh, from the sensor, that's the inductance and the capacitance. And the inductance L is a constant for a cable as long as we have a, a constant thickness of the insulation and a constant geometry. And the capacitance is, as it has shown before, uh, dependent on the dielectric permittivity of the surrounding soil. So but what happens when an TDR signal is traveling along a cable is somewhat more complex because it reacts on changes along the sensor. And I would like to show you that in a forward uh, simulation. So what you see here is basically the, uh, the coaxial cable. The yellow is the sensor. Uh, the red is a water content profile imposed on the soil surrounding the sensor. And what you will see here is then the observation of the voltage received at this point, the observation point of the TDR device. And this is then just simply a zoom in into, the, uh, into what is measured. So I start this animation. So this is the rise of the signal. So we have here the first reflection. And when you look carefully, you see that the velocity of this propagating wave changes when it enters then the free cable. So I just stop here. Um, so this is what is measured in the entirety of the uh, um, uh, of the time uh, um, um, uh, the time window. But here, this is the zoom in in the time where we basically have the travel of the sensor along the uh, the travel of the wave along the sensor. And you can see that we have here a kind of an uh, uh, a mirrored profile of the water content profile. But we cannot simply just scale what we are measuring, measuring here from time into the 
into a space simply because we have here an issue with the, uh, with the velocity of the travel time. Therefore, we need to have some inversion algorithms. I can't and I don't want to, and I can't go into detail in that, but these are the telegraph equations which describes and which were used for simulating this uh, wave propagation and which can be used to back calculate the, um, the, um, the parameters. So uh, as I said before, the inductance is a constant uh, when we use a cable like this. The resistance is also constant and can be neglected. And then we have two parameters which, are influen which influence the propagation of the wave and which are influenced by the soil. And this is the uh, uh, conductance and the capacitance. And that's why we do measurements from both ends to be able to uh, back analyze these both parameters. So this is now one example where we have a flat rim cable in soil with uh, a water table somewhere in the middle of this, uh, of this flat rim cable. And then we see here measurements from the dry side A and from the wet side B. And you can see they look very different. And the transition is also at different points, although the water table is close to the middle. Um, but with the inversion, we get then a distribution of the capacitance profile, which is shown here. Then if we use this capacitance model for the soil, we get a uh, permittivity distribution, which looks like this. And with the calibration for the soil, we basically get a profile for the volumetric water content. And if you would use only the travel time to get the mean water content, that red line would be our, our result. So this is the big advantage of using spatial TDR for this kind of, uh, of questions. So you want to know what is the distribution of water. So that technology was used in the dam, in the dam model and uh, just shortly introduced, it's a large dam. Uh, it was a large dam, it's not existing anymore, but the crest length was around 30 meter. It was around 25 meter and the base three and a half meter high with a uh, build of sand, very uniform sand with a coefficient of uniformity of two. And uh, there were numerous instrumentation. I will uh, introduce them a little bit later, but there were also 12 uh, flat rim cables, which are shown here, installed at different lengths within the, uh, the, the dam. In the base, there were some pressure transducers and the, and the base were waterproof. And uh, yeah, there was then the equipment in the hut for measuring, uh, for collecting all the data. So um, this is just a comparison of what is measured with these flat rim cables in a condition when uh, we had uh, the, the basin filled with water. This is the phreatic surface. And this is just another measurement with an alternative method, a tube sensor, which uh, basically shows very similar results. So we confirm that we are measuring here something, something meaningful, something realistic. Um, and, and later on, I will show you some examples where this model played, uh, played a role. So then the same system was also installed in a column experiments, which was designed to determine the soil water retention curve uh, for multi-step inflow and outflow experiments. Um, I will explain the content of the column a little bit later, but here's the TDR device. Uh, what was done was, let me see, the next graph should show that. We had here a ceramic plate, which, was, which allowed us to apply suction on the sample at four different locations where tensiometer installed. There was a flat rim cable placed outside the sample. Um, I will go come to that uh, soon. And the original idea was to, to deform the sample and to measure with the same sample at different density conditions, the soil water retention curve that unfortunately failed, uh, but we were able to see something else. And, and otherwise, yeah, an overflow was controlling the hydraulic head at the bottom end of the, uh, of the sample. And with this water reservoir, it was possible to, to measure the cumulative in and outflow into the sample and out of the sample. So this is the, the, uh, a close lookup for the flat rim cable, which was installed just between the rubber bag, which was encapsulating the sample and, and a glass fiber tube. So we basically had then in this case, a new sensor, yeah, the flat ribbon sensor 
surrounded by a new environment. And this is the electromagnetic field, which is then created. So we have some uh, field which goes outside the tube, but also inside the tube. But that requires some specific calibration, which is shown here. I can't go into too much detail, but we used different liquids and air and pure water, different temperatures to, uh, to get the calibration. Uh, the gray zone shows what is the relevant zone for moisture measurements. And uh, as you can see, we got here a quite nice uh, calibration. So in both cases, we need a calibration for the material. And all the tests I will show you besides of one have been done with the same material as sand, this very uh, uniform sand. Unfortunately, I've forgotten to include a grain size distribution, but particle size was between 0.5 and two millimeter. And this black dots shows you the, uh, the distribution of the permittivity versus the volumetric water content together with some other calibration functions. But yeah, we use them basically this thick black line to analyze the, from the permittivity, the volumetric water content. Okay, uh, just to show you that what was measured there uh, was also meaningful. Uh, this is one result of an experiment. Here on top, you see the hydraulic head applied on the sample. I will come back to that later again. The cumulative flow into the sample and out of the sample. And here, this is just a comparison starting from, known, from the known volumetric water content. What would be the mean volumetric water content calculated here with uh, as a line? And because there were two sensors installed, with the two sensors, the mean volumetric water content shown as symbols. So there is a quite good agreement. Good. Now coming to what is the scope of this presentation, the soil water retention curve. So we all know this, this uh, graph, which comes from, from textbooks. I don't need to go into much detail here. But reality is somewhat more complex, unfortunately. So. Um, when we are looking at measuring the soil water retention curve, what mostly is done is to take a sample fully saturated and we do, do a, a drainage test and measure then in some way a curve which maybe looks like this. And this is the primary drainage curve because it starts at full saturated conditions. But this is normally the common way to do that. And as I said, I neglect here any deformation because this is just for granular materials. So we can then derive from that curve an air entry value, which is here a bit curved, but many measurements show that they have a very distinct point uh, where we have this air entry value, especially for this condition at full, uh, when it's fully saturated. Then the other extreme is an inhibition test starting from completely dry uh, conditions. Normally, it's, this is not done, but we get another curve which lies underneath the primary, primary drainage curve, and this curve is called the primary wetting curve. To get here a point, or oh, wait a minute, no, first, there is a gap between the both ends of the curve. And this is what is called the residual air content. Yeah, And we can assume that this is around 15% of the pore space. So this theta W could be at around 85%. That's more or, more or less a rule of thumb. So from this primary wetting curve, we can somehow assume or determine an, uh, an um, water entry value. It's a bit tricky. Normally, you would say it should be lie higher, but many methods suggest then uh, that it's a bit lower. No one to go to much detail there. But then, yeah, what is then a more realistic curve is this main drainage curve, which starts basically at this residual, uh, at this water content minus this residual air content. And from there we already see one, and this is the one important message I would like to show today. We have there a zone after the water content here, where the main drainage curve ends, a zone where we have a continuous water phase and a discontinuous air phase. When we measure then starting from this water content, uh, well, it's not really true here, yeah this water content and uh, uh, a wetting curve, then we, we, we see that there is another um, 
uh, residual water content, which is basically the asymptote for the main drainage curve. And in this zone one, we have a continuous uh, air phase, but the continu discontinuous water phase. When we start from there, from the residual water content uh, and, and wetting test, we get then this main wetting curve. So I have shown this uh, primarily to show, to make clear that we have here basically three different zones. A zone where we have in zone two, main uh, the, the water and the air phase continuously distributed, which means due to pressure gradients, water and air can flow uh, through the porous medium. But then we have left and right zones where the one or the other phase is discontinuous, where we need to have other um, transport processes uh, to, to describe uh, the movement of this, of this phase. Yeah, then we have some scanning curves. Let's skip about that because this is something which is relatively well known. Um, but yeah, this curve basically suggests that all the magic happens between the two curves the primary drainage and the primary wetting curve, yeah? But these are tests or these are results which are always measured at equilibrium or close to equilibrium. So this reflects again what I was saying before. So we have, for example, here for the air phase, uh, we can have flow of air uh, from basically zero water content up to the point where our air, uh, air phase is discontinuous. And for the water, it's vice versa, basically from full saturated conditions up to the point where we reach uh, residual water content. And we somehow need to keep that in mind when we are using the solar retention curve and hydraulic conductivity to uh, calculate any uh, movement of water or air at unsaturated conditions. So uh, just very quickly, uh, an overview of the different measurement methods. What we do in a laboratory is usually something like that, where we apply an, uh, um, an pore water pressure, we weight equilibrium, and then we measure for that pore water pressure and uh, water content either by balancing when we use the Buchner funnel method or when we use a pressure plate apparatus. Yeah? Uh, we can also apply some uh, uh, flow boundary condition to do that, to get point distribution of the soda retention curve, but then there are these transient tests. So either one step outflow tests, multi-step outflow and inflow tests, which is the same category of the column experiment I will show you later. And then there are some other possibilities where you have pressure measurements with tensiometers combined with moisture measurements in order to, to get by measuring both at the same time, a kind of an in situ when you do that in the field, uh, pro, uh, so what a retention curve. And this is just another alternative where you measure in one point, the both parameters, water content and uh, uh, pore water pressure. So from literature, we know that there are the so-called dynamic effects. And uh, very early, this was observed as an overshoot of the of the curve at equilibrium. Here you can see that it's a very sharp transition, not really smooth as shown before, but the curves, these curves at the top have been measured from a, a drawdown, from drainage, faster drainage tests. And the larger the drop was, the higher is the overshoot of this uh, sort of retention curve. Similarly, we can see that when we have a spontaneous imbibition, yeah, so this is uh, a distribution, uh, the capillary pressure versus saturation, where when we do this inhibition faster, we have an undershoot of this soil water retention curve. And accordingly, we can see then the, uh, the influence also on the uh, relative, hydraulic conducti uh, relative hydraulic conductivity um, for this inhibition test. So this is something which is uh, known from literature. So now one of the mysteries I, will, I would like to show you now. Um, so this is the setup again I've shown before and here the schematic. So I don't need to explain that again, but it was basically exactly this setup where I conducted these tests. Uh, and this is for one experiment, uh, basically the hydrographs. So on top, the uh, hydraulic potential applied at the beginning, starting with suction at the, at the bottom of the sample, 
and then turning into a positive uh, uh, boundary condition and then back to the same suction condition. Here, that was the cumulative flow into and out of the sample. The points show you basically starting points where I try to back analyze with a numerical model the um, soil water retention curve, but that failed because of one specific reason I will uh, explain later. This is again the comparison of the mean water content calculated out of the cumulative flow and the measurements of the sensors. And here are the observations of the transiometers at the different locations. So just to give you an idea how that looks like, and I hope that you will see that movie. So let's stop that quickly. So I will show you now, because this is a synoptical representation of the measurements, the water content profiles measured with the two sensors. Here, that column shows you the total cumulative flow into the sample as a column. And here, this column shows you the applied, the applied head and the measured, the measured pore water pressures with the tensiometers are shown then on the side here. I need to move the window over there and I hope you can see that. Let me just start. Wait. Now, so this is that kind of experiment where the inflow and then the outflow and the changes of the water content. So this is now for this experiment, two different conditions during infiltration or imbibition and during drainage. And when we are looking at two uh, water content profiles, similar water content profiles, you can see that the uh, elevation where the, uh, um, where the phreatic surface within the sample which should have been measured is very different. So let's take, for example, this one. So we have here, uh, according to the measurements of the powder pressure, it should be basically at the bottom of the sample, while in this case, it should be nine centimeter above, yeah? So, that, of course, uh, raises the question whether we have here reached equilibrium conditions. Obviously not. Yeah? So what I will show you now is a compilation of all the observations at one observation point, which is an 80 centim 18 centimeter height. So all the water content measurements have been um, averaged over a, 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 um, um, a window of two centimeters along that height. So, and this is, this is now this compilation. So on the one hand, we have here the, um, the cumulative flow into the sample and out of the sample. Here, this is the measurement of the tensiometer at that location, the red location within the sample. So into the, uh, not into the sample. So first we start here at, uh, with, with negative, um, Porter pressure or metric suction, but that turns then eventually when we reach a certain stage when water uh, flows into the sample, a positive porter pressure, and then back again from positive to negative. The grayscale shows you the boundary condition. It's a bit complex, but we have here then starting with minus four kilopascal at the beginning, the minus two, zero, two, four, and then two, zero, minus two, minus four. So this is basically the whole, the whole uh, all the steps for the inflow and outflow experiment. And when I use then the mean water contents at that location, I see then also a uh, temporal evolution of, these, uh, of this water content first for the, uh, here for the imbibition. Yeah, so where the metric, uh, where the, the volumetric water content first increase. And then from the highest water content, when we basically return the direction of the flow, then uh, the drainage of the sample. And now when we put these both information together, we get this as a result. In the open symbols, the uh, imbibition, and in the dark symbols, the uh, solid symbols, the drainage. The curve, which would have been measured under static conditions with the same material, is shown here as triangles, and it sits far above of what is observed here. 
Yeah. But this was only one test. We have done four cycles in total. And when we put these four cycles together, we see that uh, that is the very start of the experiment, the first cycle, that we have here a loss of suction at the volumetric water content of far below 50%. Yeah. So then we have here some observations, changes of volumetric water content with positive matrix suction or powder pressure, and then here the drainage. And this is, of course, then the start for the next cycle. It's shown here, the second cycle, which stops here. That was then overnight. So there was some redistribution of water. That's why the starting point for the third cycle starts uh, a bit higher with lower water contents. But again, a little bit of more of higher water contents after the end of the uh, after end of uh, imbibition, then the drainage, and then the last cycle. So from one infiltration to the next one, we had an accumulation of water within the sample. And now you have to remember the start was at partly saturated conditions at the water content, which, which was approximately the residual water content of the soil according to the static soil water retention curve. So this was a quite interesting uh, uh, result, which belongs to one of those mysteries that when you, uh, do an imbibition test, drainage test, that you accumulate water with re repeated cycles. Uh, this is just, again, the uh, volumetric water content measured. And you see here that from one cycle to the other, so that was the first, the second, the third, and the fourth, that we get more and more water stored within the sample. So can we see that also in the field? And here what I did, so this is the, the uh, just again, the cross-section of the dam model. Uh, I just did what was part of the measurement method shown before. I, com I combined the tensometer measurements at three different locations with an average, in a similar way, two centimeter above and below the flat rim cable, uh, mo moisture measurements along that uh, flat rim cable. And what we see then here, uh, stop, yeah, and what I will show you are results basically for the whole experiment, yeah, at these different, different locations. So we have a relatively steep rise of the water table within the basin, and this is the drainage. This is the seepage here, and now these are the evolutions of the uh, more or less in situ measured so water retention curves. And we see at the very beginning when the uh, when we have the rise of the water table, water has not reached the points uh, at the, the observation points which are given here. But eventually, the first one is of course the lowest one, which is reached by the water. And we have here again a very fast drop of the metric suction and increase in positive water pressure, and that continues uh, with positive water pressure. Eventually. Eventually, we see that then on the second tensometer and then on the third. And then we have here where we have an accumulation of points, the static, the, the, the uh, uh, phreatic surface at steady state conditions. And eventually, we, we revise the direction. And you see that we then get a uh, reduction of the powder pressure, reduction of the water content. Yeah? And eventually, eventually, and closed hysteresis. What is amazing here is that um, the curves look exactly the same. They only seem to be shifted in the vertical axis with different uh, uh, transitions of the uh, phreatic, uh, of the soda retention curve with the with the zero potential line, where we have basically the, the, the transition from uh, positive to negative pore water pressures. So, but this is just another observation which confirms what was observed on the, uh, in the column. So just to wrap that up, um, one, uh, some, some remarks on, on the solar retention curve. So there can be conditions, powder pressure versus uh, water content, uh, so combinations of powder pressure and water content, which are far outside the uh, equilibrium solar retention curve. And that depends on the change, on the rate of the changes. 
So how far can these conditions be outside of, uh, of that static sort of retention curve is one uh, important question here. Um, during spontaneous inhibition conditions, suction as a negative border pressure can get lost at very low saturations. So this was a, a very interesting observation and uh, unfortunately, we could, I couldn't continue with these experiments. A student of mine has started to work on that, but he's not finished yet. Um, but it is, it is somehow a bit frightening to think about that we can lose um, uh, suctions already at very low saturations. Um, but is this only a local phenomenon because we measure with a tensor meter only in a small, in a small range, or is it something something bigger. And then when we have cyclic inhibition and drainage, uh, we can have an accumulation of the water phase. And is this also possible for the non-wetting phase? So I see part is pushing me a little bit, but I try to hurry up, yeah, not to getting too long with the presentation. Um, so let's, let's skip this. So this is only, I think what is important is only this graph here, where I will then show you some observations where where uh, at the dam model, some artificial irrigation was conducted, followed by um, an, uh, a flooding test. And let me just, these are the conditions observed by the red lines. Let's skip this. So these are the observations made during this experiment. So there were the three uh, irrigation tests in three different phases. You see how the water content changes. And this is now the race of the water table within the basin the phreatic surface measured with powder pressures measurements in the base. Uh, but the line was basically, ah, stop. The line is then just simply connected. So it's not entirely true because of course we have there some, some bending due to the, uh, to the flowing water, but there is a good, trans, a, a good confirmation, a good agreement between moisture measurements and the phreatic surface. I have stopped this now because of one reason. You see below it's a saturation and the saturation never reaches 100%. Yeah. First, when I've seen these results, I thought, well, maybe the moisture measurements are not that accurate. Yeah. I was happy that I've never measured water contents beyond 100% because I knew the porosity quite well. And as, as you remember, the calibration was done for the volumetric water contents. So it should have been always below 100%, above 100, 100% could have been possible, but yeah, there might be a physical reason why we have here uh, saturations below 100%. And in order to explain that, I will show you an experiment, results of an experiment very old. It was the first experiments conducted with a student I was supervising when I started my PhD. And in this case, a uh, 2D model with uh, 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 a rather widely graded soil was um, um, affected by a or suddenly raised water table. And what you then have is an infiltration front, which infiltrates at the beginning with high gradients and the gradient reduces the further the infiltration fronts penetrates into the sand, uh, into the sample. So what was observed there uh, was that we have at the beginning at high gradients, some um, flow into coarse layers and coarse lenses of the soil basically encapsulating then zones where we have fine soil, yeah? And vice versa, with some distance to the, uh, to the entrance of the water, we have then uh, at lower gradients, water is, the water flow is driven by capillary forces. So water flows into the, into the uh, finer lenses, encapsulating air in the coarser lenses, yeah? So this was one observation made in this experiment. And then when you come back to the observations at the, uh, the, uh, the dam model, it makes them completely sense that there is on the one hand water contents below 100% and on the other hand, it seems to be that uh, close to the uh, inlet of the phase where the water enters the dam, the saturations are higher than uh, with some distance close to the seepage phase. Well, again, just an observation where we would need to do some more investigations to show that this is, is truly the case. So um, let me just show again this little video and you see that we always have some penetration of water into the dam up to a certain depth.
but then it seems to disappear. You see in the middle, there's not a lot of change in, in, in the water content during this irrigation test. So this is under the heading preferential flow in slopes. So when I take now the two measurements at the very beginning of before the irrigation started and after the last irrigation, this becomes more obvious. So here there are some zones where there's no change in water content at all. And when we just take the difference, we can see that there is some significant change of water content um, close to the surface, but in the core, there's nothing. So in order to investigate what the reason could be for this, uh, I did some 2D flume tests where I uh, applied some irrigation with droplets from the top to have an infiltration which was significantly smaller than the hydraulic conductivity of the sample. And in this case, uh, it was not a homogeneous. I will come to this sample a bit later. It was an inclined sample. Let me just quickly show you this, the result of this experiment in the movie. Not now, let's close. Can you see? No, you can't see, oh, that's a shame. Let me just go back and try to start that differently because it would be a shame if you would not be able to see it. Now you can see it. So here, this is now the infiltration of water into this sloped sample. So it looks a bit like there is an, uh, a front, a unit front of water flowing in, in the sample. Um, but eventually when then the moisture front reaches here, this is a drain, the bottom, there, there are outlets by the way in the bottom so that air and water can flow out. It seems that there's an acceleration of water flowing basically along the slope down along the base of this sample. And if you look then at a kind of a contour plot, which shows this infiltration, it becomes more obvious that here it starts to stagnate while along the base, the water flows more rapidly, yeah? So this was one observation made that the model confirmed and by this model test that there is an preferential flow of water just in the, uh, that can be just in the, in the wetted zone close to the surface. So the last, um, the last topic with, uh, with pre uh, preferential flow is fingering. And we know fingering from, it's a well investigated uh, problem in environmental sciences and geoenvironmental sciences, where this plays a huge role in, uh, in the transport of contaminants. Um, and when you have some coarse material, you really get pronounced fingers a little bit like when water flows against the window and you have fingers of water flowing down the window, it's very basically the same and you have very coarse material. But the observations from the dam model somehow uh, make me wondering whether there might be fingering also occurring in, the, uh, in my sand. So let's simply show again another video, which shows one experiment where basically I had just the sand from the dam model built in this 2D uh, chamber with irrigation from the top. Um, so this is now the, the animation of, of the pictures. The infiltration was roughly, so the infiltration rate was roughly 100 times smaller than the hydraulic conductivity of the sample. And you see that there is an, uh, a rather unstable front penetrating into the sample. And you could have a little bit the impression that there is some preferential flow starting, but always the water seems to flow left and right instead of vertically down. And the reason for this, and you can see that on the different colors of the material, there was a little bit of segregation of the sand when the, when the chamber was filled. The sand was used dry to fill with the tube, the chamber from bottom up, and that created this kind of very small scale heterogeneity. So as I said before, 
the um, particle size distribution had a coefficient of uniformity of just two. So it was just a marginal kind of change. Uh, but that changed this experiment. So what I did was basically to make the sand a little bit moist, to fill this, uh, the, this chamber again, and then to dry the sample with uh, dry air flowing from the base up. And this is now another movie I would like to show. And this is the last I will show today. So here, the same material, just more homogeneous, same experiment. And what you see is basically what I wanted to see here. There is the start of the preferential flow. Yeah. So first one, it's not really a finger. It rather looks like a, a big thumb. Uh, and there is a second one. So, but what is important here, that little change in heterogeneity or homogeneity basically allowed me then to, to observe the fingers I was hoping to see in the experiment before. And, um, and that made me wondering that this kind of, of preferential flow would probably not happen in the dam model I was, I was investigating. So the concluding remarks to that second part, and that's then also the end of my presentation. Um, the infiltration of water into a porous medium, regardless whether driven by high gradients or metric suction, never leads to fully saturated conditions. Um, um, that, that, of course, triggers then the question, do we need to take that into account that we have some residual air in the water phase? Probably for some conditions we need to. The water content differences in slopes can lead to preferential flow due to quasi-capillary barrier effects. Um, it is a good question whether we need to, uh, to take that into account when we, uh, when we have to assess the stability of a slope. Um, nevertheless, it was also observed in, in nature when sampling was done that there is always a little bit of a wet, wetter, wetter zone than uh, in the drier zone in some depth. Heterogeneities influence the flow of water vertically and horizontally and can avoid the development of preferential flow in form of fingering. That, of course, raises the question whether we take into account adequately the influence of heterogeneities. Um, in some cases, we don't need to, but in some cases, we probably should. So overall, just as a comment, do we need to expand our concepts of testing, parameterizing, and incorporating the soil water retention curve for soil hydraulics and mechanics? I don't think so. But for some cases, we might need to. Yeah, And that's why I also deleted the soil retention curve and wrote pore water pressure water content conditions because it's not a curve. It's not even a set of curves. It is something which can, which can be very different to what we would expect if we do some testings in the lab. Is it adequate to consider the water phase within a soil as uncompressible under the presence of encapsulated air bubbles? Probably not. And in some conditions, I think here, for example, pressure changes in canals or so, where this might play a role, where then the water phase as a continuum behaves rather compressible than, inc than incompressible. And how realistic is it to conduct tests at as homogeneous as possible conditions and at full water saturated conditions. I mean, everyone knows how difficult it is to fully saturate a sample. And yeah, to some degree, that's the nature. Maybe one should think of doing tests in this way and, and rather quantifying the influence than trying to avoid it. But I'm at the end of my presentation and I would like to thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the measurements themselves are rather quick. It is more than the, um, uh, the handling of the data, but I think when I remember right, um, the measurements were done in roughly one minute, maximum two minutes. Um, but it is at the end of the day a question how many measurements you would like to do and to average them. Um, because at the end, if you've seen uh, one measurement is basically in milliseconds or in nanoseconds, and um, and what we realized in the past was in one case measurements of 
30 measurements per second. So you can do that very quick, yeah? But of course, uh, the question is valid. If the uh, uh, measurement takes too long, you basically average over a certain time the water content profile. But I think in that case, it was around one minute for one measurement. No, it's more a function of the points you would like to measure. Yeah, okay. so you basically say you want to have a certain number of points and a certain number of average measurements to as uh, measurements to average them, and this is basically what what defines the um, the duration of a measurement. Ah, <laughs> yeah, there was. Um, I can show that movie again because I was not showing the entire movie. There, there, there is. It was sand, but on the surface we had a thin, maybe 15 centimeter thick uh, layer of topsoil with sand. So there is a drain, I didn't mention that. So the, uh, uh, all in all, the dam was safe because of the drain we had, we could collect the water. So now there should be soon then the drawdown and there is not, not, uh, a severe lag between the drawdown. So you can see it drew, drew down quite, quite simultaneously within the embankment and in the basin. Yeah, well, there is always uh, the bottleneck. You can't simply get the water out immediately. It will, when I remember right, 600 cubic meter of water or so. So you have to give that some time to get out, yeah. But yeah, no, there was no lag. Well, the good thing is that um, the, the, there was quite some development in terms of devices. So TDR devices are getting miniaturized. Yeah. And you can even use some sophisticated sensors like this mini VNA in combination with the flat driven cable. You don't measure then in the, in the time domain, you measure in the frequency domain and need to do the analysis in the frequency domain. Um, I think it, it is, there is room for that um, technology to be used in practice, but only when you really want to know the, uh, the water content distribution. Yeah. If you are fine with some average numbers, maybe even over, you could even have some very simple measurements. We talked about this some time ago for roads where we wanted to know, um, over different widths, the water content. So just simply using then flare driven cables in different lengths with a very simple measurement technology at the end to give you then for that length and uh, uh, I mean water content. The issue is you can't use um, uninsulated rods uh, over a length larger than 30 centimeter. I think 30 centimeters is absolute maximum. When it gets too large, then you basically lose the complete energy of the signal and you can't see anything. You need then to work with, uh, with insulated sensors and the, the ribbon cable is quite nice to work with when you, uh, when you can install it during construction. To install the sensor uh, in an existing body, it's a bit more tricky. Uh, 